On and off, I've talked a lot about rabbits, but that's because we spent most of our childhood trying to catch them. Those were the days when the rabbit was a main food animal. In the days of the agricultural depression and the previous great mass unemployment, in the days before social security, the small people in the country used to grow a lot of potatoes and they grew all their own vegetables, but the search for protein was the great one. And uh, that really was a matter of poaching or catching rabbits, which we endlessly did by various methods. A lot of these methods I've shown you, but none, one I never have, because I couldn't, because in real life you could never see it. On the other hand, it was sometimes the most successful method, so I thought I'd show it to you in daylight, so that all that happens now is just a mock-up of what would really happen on a very black and very windy night. I'm walking with my rabbit-catching friend just along the front of a hedge, and in the hill behind it you can see the earth is all beaten up with rabbit burrows, miles of them. You can see that the tips of the wild briars have got nipped off as they tried to steal out in the food, and you can also see that some of those rabbit burrows have been taken over by the badger, which has increased enormously since it was protected. And you see that the badger's just cut a hole in the sheep wire there. His teeth are like wire cutters anyway, but he can come through. But anyway, somebody's had a go at these particular rabbits with a shotgun, I see. A messy way of doing it. Nobody wants a food animal all shot up. And you can also see that the grass here is very, very cropped short and covered with rabbit droppings. But if we walk out here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, about ten yards, we're in long and luscious grass. Now this could be a field of seed grass, it also could be a field of young corn, and what has happened is that the young rabbits have bred in their thousands, and they're at, at dawn and dusk now, they're easing out and they're gradually eating their way into the field. And as we all know, they could uh, uh, get rid of acres of young corn or valuable seed, seed grass this way. Now, on a very dark night, when food close to the hedge gets scarce, when it's black and there's nothing to be seen and the wind uh, keeps other sounds off, they will steal out, and they'll steal out individually and they'll spread themselves all over that main field. So if we could catch them on the way back, if we could set a net as between the rich feed and the hedge, in the way that I'm demonstrating here, and if we could do it without them knowing we've done it, then we would have a real chance of catching quite a lot of them. On one occasion by this method, we cost 56 in one night. As a matter of fact, this picture is being spoiled for us a bit by the people who are cutting the silage. But all that in front of us would be rich feed, and from about where I'm standing on this dark night, the rabbits would creep out there, and they'd eat their way through. So on a very dark night, we would come, and we'd try and stretch a net absolutely silently, without a, a word, without a sound from the foot or from a rattle, and actually creep it along so it came behind them. In order to do this, we'd probably have to walk round about a mile to find a secret entrance to this thing. Down there, there's a hedge from which we should do it. And the most important thing, from my father's point of view, was that he should wear his fly coat. Give me my fly coat, he used to say, when we were going rabbit netting. That was a coat where the buttons were enclosed in front of a fly front, and therefore there were no buttons sticking out. Because if anybody tried to set a net with buttons in the way, he'd soon be in trouble. We're lucky nowadays because there's so many army coats nowadays which don't have any buttons showing in the front, that getting hold of a rabbiting coat nowadays would be no difficulty at all. So here we would come, and we'd creep out there, one man is carrying the long net. Now this net's about 150 yards long and about as high as a tennis net. And set loosely, so creatures would catch in it, to about the height of a tennis net. 
It'll run about 90 or 100 yards. And it'll be set on these hazel stakes, which we cut for the purpose. We used to carry these in a sewn-up sack, but I discovered halfway through my life that the best possible way to carry them was in an old golf bag. So I bought that old golf bag for 50p in the market. Uh, and I'm sure the Colonel, if he's still alive, wouldn't be ashamed that his golf bag was being used for such a sporting purpose. Anyway, man number one is going to creep along absolutely silently. Remember, all of this has got to be done without giving a hint to nervous rabbits who are out feeding across the whole of that field. And three or four paces apart, all the way along there, he's going to set those stakes in the soft ground. It's a bit hard at the moment. Usually rabbiting time, which is about September, October, you can get the stakes in easily enough. But you had an instinct for, you had to have an instinct for walking in a straight line. And then num man number two would come along and he'd just drop that net out. It's arranged on the hazel stick so it will fall off without tangling. And you can see now why you don't need any buttons. And he'd start to hook it in to the top of those notches in the top of those hazel sticks. And he'll get the top line fairly tight. Well, very tight, in fact. But he'll leave the net itself baggy and hanging below it. In the meanwhile, I've got somewhere on near the 90 yards of net which we should be setting. And he follows me along. And as they, all this has to be done by two men absolutely trained themselves to work in partnership, each to know what the other is doing without any communication and without a single, even firm footfall. This man's been a rabbit catcher all his life. And you rely upon the fact that he knows how to do it. As a matter of fact, as always with country sings, I found he did it slightly different from what we do. What we used to do was to walk along with the net first and the man with the sticks then came afterwards, following the course of the net with his feet and putting each stake in and stretching the net to it as he went. But all these people who've done it all their lives all have slightly different methods. Anyway, that's what it would look like, except it is invisible in the dark when it was set. And what he's doing now is making sure that it spoons out to the front towards the rabbits because then as they hit it their feet will be on the net and the net won't run away from them. They'll hold the net to them, so to speak. And there's the rabbit net set. And many a time in the years when you're learning this job you get halfway along and you hear the scuttle of every rabbit in the field running crash into the berries because you think now. One man in a larger team, two men, will be posted behind this net, deal with the rabbits as they run in it. And the other one, or two sometimes, or even three, you might have left some men over the other side there, has got to walk immensely quietly right round the field to the far end, and then they're going to walk up that field towards the net, quartering it as they come. He's going to look out for a tremor in the net, you see. He'll hold the top of the net so that when a rabbit hits the net, he'll know that there's one. And by the strength of the tremor, he'll know how near it is. And he's got to get to it, and he'll mainly dispatch that rabbit, which he's very good at, before it squeaks and puts all the other rabbits back. Or sends them all at once, because sending them all at once is no good because they can't be dealt with. So, we've here's a representation of what the rest of the people are doing. And we're walking along and we want, if we can, to try and scare these rabbits up one at a time. Not a whole rush that the chaps behind the net can't deal with. So we're walking still quite quietly and rattling a matchbox gently. That's a sound which doesn't scare them from a long way off, but in the combination of the feel of the footsteps and the thing will just scare up each rabbit as you come close to it. And as I say, we once got 56 rabbits in one drive this way. The next day we took them around the back doors of all the hounds, 
Had to get nine pence each for them. That's four and a half p in modern money for these rabbits. Everybody had a dinner and we had some money. So we come. I would be walking in the long grass, you see. The mower has uh, interfered with this a bit since we started. But, and from time and again, as we came up, rabbits would move forward and he'd have to be ready to deal with them. And finally, as each rabbit came in, you've got to find it quickly. There you go. And dispatch it, you see. There. My hat is dead in a moment. <laughs> well, there's the net, you see, as it hangs in the shed. You can see it's been dyed different colours as he made it, in order that it doesn't give a clear line against the uh, hedge if there's a faint bit of light. It's always got to be kept so that it's ready, so that if your father says, it's a dark night and there's a wind, we'll take the rabbit net out, it's ready to fall perfectly properly off there like that. And this one, of course, is linen of cotton thread, and it has to be dried afterwards. That's the trouble, or else it'll rot. So the whole of this has to be dried out. They've made one or two of the modern fibred, modern fibres, but they're not as good. And some of the poachers even had silk ones, which would go up tiny into a poacher's pocket. Well, there it is. The method of wrapping catching that I haven't been able to show you, but I have at least indicated in detail. Cheerio. Yeah. man sent those to me and asked me what they were. I couldn't believe it, really. It just really divides the generations, that sort of thing. Uh, anybody my age would know what those were. And Amy, particularly, they remind me of one of the most painful things in my life. Up till about 1924, our farmhouse was lit with oil lamps. And they were all around the house in the various rooms. And every morning, my mother used to carry them all down to the back kitchen to clean them. It was very important because if you left them for a couple of days without cleaning oil lamps, the whole house began to smell. It was only a very scrupulous housewife who cleaned them every day, rubbed them down every day, who could keep them clean. So down they came every day, they were cleaned right up every day, back they went to the rooms every day. She'd done it all her life, as her mother taught her. And then in 1924, we put electricity into the farm. In those days, you were allowed to do it. If you put the poles up yourself across the farm, the electricity people would run the line for you. And when the time came, uh, my mother, with enormous ceremony and great joy, took these oil lamps, I think there were nine of them, and put them in the attic, said goodbye to them forever. And this was used in that process, because every day a little bit of the black has to be snipped off the top of an oil lamp. It's very dirty. But if you snip it with these, you see the little bit of wick is held in there, and then you can tip it carefully into whatever it is you're collecting with, and you don't make a mess all over the lamp. The bitter thing about the story is that when we left the farm, we left the lamps there, because by then my mother had forgotten about them and was glad to leave them. And, nine, and seven of the nine were Bristol blue glass. Sometimes I've seen such lamps for sale now in antique shops in the Wigmore Road when I've been to London and I realised what they would be worth now if she hadn't left them. But still, anyway, there's the answer to that chap and uh, I'll send them back to him. His pair is only really interesting because they've never been used. You may have noticed they weren't shiny. They were cast and for some reason or other this set was never polished up, which makes it rather interesting. Cost them some very beautiful ones, these made in silver for the great houses. We get these things that people don't know uh, and sometimes you can't answer because the th in every part of England in farming life, things were done differently. And uh, time and again, when I found something that I couldn't identify, I can identify most of them, they belong somewhere near our district, uh, uh, I've had to ask the viewers, and this is the one we've never solved. Take a look at this. You see, I don't know what it is. Is some sort of scraper or skimmer. 
It's very light metal. It wasn't for heavy work. Somebody said it might do to scrape the bottom of a ditch, but there are bigger, better ones from that. I don't know what it is. Well, it was used for skimming off the top of something that was soaked, perhaps flax or something like that. All I can say is, I don't know what it is, and I'd be delighted if somebody could tell me. As I say, most of the things that turn up at the old farm sales, I can identify them immediately, although, and they make me feel extremely nostalgic. The trouble is there are so few of these farm sales nowadays. 20 years ago when small farms were still closing up and old people were dying in them, there used to be sales at which all the contents of the house and the barns came out together, and it was interesting. It's very rare now, but last year there was one. There was one in our district, a very big farm. The stuff in the house had all been sold, but all the stuff that got backed away in the back of the barns through all the years was brought out. And down we went. And down went a lot of other people uh, on what I may say was just about the coldest day in the year. A lot of people who knew nothing. This, that's somebody, that lady said to the man that those were porter's trolleys, and they aren't, they're sack lifters. These are the old wooden <coughs> seed drills, which were pulled by two horses when we were seeding the uh, cornfields. They are forgotten and gone forever. Even in these piles of iron, you find things which are mysterious shape to people who were born since our time, but which you can identify immediately. That, for instance, uh, that is a turntable which had a big beam on it and round it walked a horse, driving the elevator that put the hay up on the ricks. That was my first job. At the age of six, I had to sit on the ladder with a pocket full of small stones. When the horse went to sleep, I had to throw them at him to wake him up. And there aren't, it was work, well, even though I wasn't paid for it, it was work because I had to do it. And there aren't many people in this world who say that their first job in life was to throw stones at a horse's backside. And, uh, there's the memory of it, the very machine pegged to the ground for the horse to pull round and drive the thing. And there's a, coming out an amazing thing. It's an original McCormick reaper. Not a reaper and binder, just a reaper. The first time they cut corn without a scythe, managed to do it with horsepower, like that. And uh, I was told when I was a little boy, when the first of these came into uh, our village, the old man Jim Hines was driving it, and people came for miles and miles and miles in their pony carts across the county to see this amazing new thing, thing, just as they might go nowadays to see the first rocket they'd ever seen fired. And they all took old Jim into the pub, or followed him into the pub to ask him questions about it. He got so drunk he couldn't ask them on free drinks. Those are interesting. They're the back chains from cart horse harness, twisted, you see, so they lie flat in harness. And there's an interesting thing about those. Those were all made by women. It was supposed to be one of the most oppressed industries. They were ill-paid and they worked in the open at open forges, whole villages of women. There were chain villages up in the Midlands and these women, blacksmiths, used to make those heavy flat chains that were used to go over the back of a horse's collar. bits and pieces everywhere that bring back memories. Now this is just shows how beautiful things were in those days. That's just a sack truck. This was used, of course, for moving corn sacks, but you can buy sack trucks now at the garden centre. Little metal sack truck for pushing uh, uh, fertiliser sacks down the garden or taking the dustbin out to the dustbins. But look at that, built by the cart builder in exactly the same method as was used. Thing. And that is a jack a giant jack which would lift a loaded wagon if it was uh, if the wheels started to go wrong. You tap that and find it's not cracked. That's probably very valuable now because that's the iron ring that lay in the yard of the uh, wheelwright around which he built a circular filed fire to heat the iron tires and expand them when he put them on the wheels. Those are sought after now that people are building carts again. Now there's a, a farm wagon, you see, a wooden farm wagon. Took a year to build, altered it at one harvest, paid for it after the next. And here's a spring wagon. Nowadays I hear them indiscriminately called uh, farm wagons. 
but there's a very big difference. You'll notice that the farm wagon doesn't have springs, it's on solid axles. It can rumble over the ground with a heavy load. It won't break and it won't rock. And yet this one, you see, has got springs on it. This is a spring wagon, which meant it went on the road. That might have been, that would belong to a local transport firm, or perhaps to, firm, or perhaps to a miller who moved uh, around. Now these little apparently nondescript stools, yet to a person who knows, knows exactly what they are, those are platting up stools. Heavy horses were so he tall that when you wanted to plait their manes, you had to have something to stand on. So in every old heavy horse stable, there'd be a couple of, couple of platting up stables like that, platting up stools like that, to give you the height necessary to plait his mane. Alongside them, a series of pegs cut out the hedge for hanging the harness on. Sell the selling started already. The auctioneers have come down. Amazing mixture of people, as I say. Some people who know all about these things. Some people who know nothing about them at all have got a craze to, <coughs> to, to buy them. One person one day bought a machine, uh, pointed a machine out to me and said, what's that? And I said, it's a turnip cutter. And he said, oh, is it? I said, who bought it? He said, I did. I said, what are you going to do with it? So I'm going to paint it red and put it in the garden. We never knew what it was when he bought it. There's the old side rake, the tedder that turned the hay over into rows when it was drying to pull it pick it up. I used to get on that at the age of eleven, after breakfast, behind a heavy, slow old horse, and drive and drive and drive and drive and drive up and down the field. It was a job that kids were trusted with, and it went on forever. Life seems to go out lightning now, but we get half into the morning, it'd been about three years. We used to shout to somebody and say, Will it be dinner time soon? And yet nowadays you just get up in the morning and the evening's here. And here under cover, they've got the harness. Well, of course, there really is a market for that, as we all know. And for the harness decorations. These were only used on high days and holidays. The chains, you see, had to keep those bright with a bag of silver sand. And the tassel terrets, which were used on the cover for the thing. And there goes the man who was born to an earth privy into a plastic loo. <laughs> There we are. As the years go by, we see fewer and fewer of those. Every time we do see one, we usually, if it's in a district where we weren't born, we usually see something we don't know. The museums are full of these things. Sometimes you see them slightly wrongly labelled. Sometimes nobody's able to label at all. And one of those things is this. So I'll show it to you again. There it is. It's some sort of scoop or skimmer. And I'd be delighted to be told. Cheerio. I'll go and uh, do a bit of skittling.